about eight years ago, uh, I was teaching my granddaughter Haley how to pray, and, and I remember telling her that when you pray, uh, just bow your head, close your eyes, and then tell God what's on your heart. And frankly, bowing your head and closing your eyes are optional. Uh, the main thing about prayer is just be honest with God and, and let Him know what's really going on. Now, that seemed to me a good idea to tell her that, but uh, it came back to bite me later. In fact, uh, Bishop Sandy Green and his wife Gigi came here to visit. It. And after the worship services that morning, uh, we left here and took them to lunch at Scopolo's at the old location. And uh, so we all ordered our food, and uh, and uh, finally the food all came out. And you could tell that Haley was really, really disgusted at the escargot that Gigi had ordered. And so she asked if she could pray for the food, and I said sure. And so with the bishop and uh, she calls herself the Bishoprina, and my, you know we're all there around this table. And Haley closes her eyes and bows her head, and she says, "Lord, bless this food that it not be poisonous to our bodies, because we know we're not supposed to eat snails." And I could have crawled under the table. Fortunately, Bishop Sandy and Gigi had a good sense of humor. Despite that embarrassment, I still believe that prayer is fundamentally important. And according to polls, somewhere around 75% of Americans pray every single day. And somewhere around 95% of those people who pray claim that at some point in time that God has answered their prayer. They know it was a supernatural answer from God. What the polls don't tell us is how many times those people prayed and they didn't get an answer. Because i got to tell you, I made a lot of prayers, and for the life of me, I'm really not sure that God even heard them. I mean, have you ever had those times in your life where you pray and pray and pray and pray, and it seems like the the heavens are brass, and your prayers just kind of bounce off, that, that they get nowhere, and it's a really frustrating time. We all go through those sort of dry times where our faith shrinks and, and we're just not sure anymore. You may be praying for God to meet some need in your life right now. Something pressing in your life. Uh, it may have to do with your job or friends or family or an illness. Uh, but most of us are praying passionately in our life for something that's, that sort of got us in a tight place. Most of us always have a pressing need in our life. But for most of us, we think, well, God's just not listening. God's just not there. Someone once told me that God is a lot like our pastor. We never see him during the week, and we don't understand him on Sunday. Uh, Jesus understood that people were tempted to give up on God. They were tempted to kind of go, you know, I, I, this is mumbo jumbo. This, maybe this is not even working. May, maybe this is not even real. This parable that we read this morning is a tough one for us to understand, but it makes more sense, I think, if I can add a little cultural context to it so that you'll understand. First, uh, you have to understand that there were no careers for women where they could earn a decent living. Girls got married around the age of 13 or 14, usually to older men. Consequently, when their husbands died, uh, they were in trouble unless their husbands left them with some money. Poor widows were often taken advantage of uh, and, and that seems to be the case in our parable today. The people could relate to that. Particularly the women who were there could relate to that. She couldn't afford a lawyer and apparently had no kinsman redeemer that would take her side and provide for her. And her, influ her um, only recourse was just to go and throw herself on the mercy of this judge, this local justice. Uh, local judges were often just influential businessmen who were given authority to hear and decide local matters. 
Unfortunately, this particular judge that ruled over the area where she lived was heartless and he was godless. He, the Bible tells us that he neither feared God nor man and so there was nothing to compel him to simply do the right thing when it came to this widow, when it came to any of those people. For obvious reasons, this parable has been called the parable of the unjust judge. Ironically, in, in the parable, the unjust judge stands in the place of God. In fact, biblically, all people in authority stand in a place of God. They, they, they represent God, if you will. Uh, because all authority ultimately comes down from God. So whether you're uh, a leader, uh, a president, a mayor, a governor, or a parent, the authority that you stand in is really God's authority. But the parable is not meant to portray God as heartless, uh, who cared neither for God nor men. Uh, in fact, the parable tells us that this unjust judge, as heartless and uncaring as he was, finally did the right thing. And the point is, how much more shall your heavenly Father, who is actually the opposite of this unjust judge, Meet your needs when you pray. Uh, because when this woman was praying, there were a number of things. The Bible says that, first off, the, the judge was not very good. So the parable is teaching us that we need to pray without ceasing because unlike this unjust judge, God is very, very good. The judge is portrayed as amoral, not having a moral concept of right and wrong. It wasn't that he was evil. He just didn't see that there were any rules in regard to him. He has no external motivation to do the right thing because he doesn't fear God. He doesn't fear man. He is immune from criticism and so he does whatever is best for him but in striking contrast to this man God is actually the very essence and the very definition of what is good there are a lot of people who are mad at God frankly because of some catastrophic event that's occurred in, in your lives and you've blamed God for it because if God is good then how in the world could he stand by and allow that thing to happen. How could my spouse have died? My child have died? How could this person who is godless and evil have succeeded and triumphed over me? How in the world can God who is good allow evil? Most so-called atheists in the world are people who once possessed a real passion and faith for God, but they were disappointed. True atheists are people who had that close relationship with God and somehow God didn't meet them when they thought that he should. And they're convinced that it was God's fault, but they experienced the death of a, a loved one or convinced that if God's all-powerful, he should have healed that child, that sibling, that spouse. But James makes it real clear when he writes these words. Every good... And perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. In fact, James goes on to say that God is not evil, nor is he tempted by evil. Francis Fenelon, a, a Catholic mystic, said, God is so good that he only awaits our desire to overwhelm us with a gift of himself. God's very nature is actually the standard of goodness. I've said before that it's not as if God is good because he's measured by some sort of external standard of good. God is the plumb line. He is the standard. He is the definition of good. God doesn't say, well, that's evil and that's good. No, God puts himself as the standard and whatever falls away from that are the things that are wrong or that are evil. God is the very essence of good. It's been said that there's nothing that God can't do, but I disagree. 
there's one thing God can't do, and that's act against His nature, which is, in its very essence, good. Whatever God does is for the greatest good possible, given the circumstances. The problem is, we don't see all the circumstances. We don't know all the things that are lined up. We don't know the ripple of effects of every incident. Our minds are not able to even begin to comprehend the complexities of so many people with competing agendas. But God always does the very best and the very greatest and the very kindest thing that He can possibly do. We had a church in Denver that uh, that grew quite large, and they had a slogan, and, and it was on bumper stickers, God is good all the time. It's not that He's good some of the time when He does what we think He ought to do. It's not that He's good uh, occasionally when we get our way. God is good all the time. In fact, they had a little liturgy the way they opened their service. The pastor would say, God is good, and the people would respond all the time. God is good all the time. Even when we think He's off the job. Even when we think maybe He's not listening. We can pray in confidence this parable teaches us and with persistence because God will act in a way that, that God will never act in a way that contradicts His own nature and His very nature and His very essence is goodness. But God's not only good, He is personally committed to each of us. The, the unjust judge, the problem was not just that He was amoral, but He didn't care. He had no concern. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about man. The judge had no personal relationship with this widow. Probably didn't even know her name. She was just some poor stranger begging for a handout. That is in stark contrast to God who has an intimate and personal love with each and every one of us. The Bible teaches us that He knit us together in our mother's womb. He named us before we were ever, now get this, conceived. He, he knows you far more than you know yourself. He knows every detail. He, he knows your thoughts before you think them. He knows when you arise. He knows when you sleep. He knows the number of your days. He has numbered them. He has counted them. God really, unlike the unjust judge, cares tremendously. Sunday school class, uh, uh, youngsters were having problem repeating the Lord's Prayer, uh, but they didn't lack an imagination. And one child prayed, Our Father who art in heaven, how do you know my name? Uh, <laughs> he knows more than our name. He knows our deepest needs, our deepest fears, our deepest hopes, our deepest dreams, our greatest longings. God's numbered our days, kind of the hairs on our head. He knows the worst of us. And think of this. He called us to be His children knowing what we were going to do. <laughs> Chew on that. He called you to be His son, His daughter, knowing that you were going to betray Him. Knowing that you were going to ignore Him. Knowing that you were going to walk away. Knowing that you were going to harbor sin in your heart. And yet He called you anyway. He loves us passionately. 1 John 4, 9 says, And this is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He first loved us and He sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins while we were yet far away. 
It's tough to love somebody who's far away, who hates you, who goes against you. It's really tough. And to go beyond that, to offer the most precious thing that you have in order to bring that person close is beyond our ability to conceive. God does care. And here's the way that we know that He cares. In our prayers, He doesn't always give us what we want. <laughs> That's probably the biggest way that we know that He cares. Ruth Graham, the wife of Billy Graham, said that, I'm fortunate that God doesn't always answer my prayers the way I pray them. I would have married the wrong man several times. <laughs> And we all can relate to that. We know exactly what that means. That, that, that sometimes our prayers are not the best for us. The watchman D, Chinese martyr, said God will answer all our prayers and all of our questions in one way and in one way only by showing us more of His Son. And so when we pray, if the answer is He can show us more of who He is, then that's the form the answer will take. He will always move us closer to that place where we have a relationship with Him. Because frankly, guys, our petty little temporal agendas are nothing compared to the prize of the high calling of knowing Him who has redeemed us. God knows that. He made us for Himself. And so the highest thing that He could do, the best thing, the goodest, I know that's not a word, Taylor, don't write that down. The goodest thing that He could do is to draw us to His heart because God cares. So we're to pray without giving up. We're, we're to pray persistently because, number one, God is good. He's the very essence of good. And He will always act in accordance with His nature. And He cares passionately and intimately about each and every one of us. That is amazing. When we I mean, that's amazing that God loves us to that degree. But the best is yet to come. We're to pray without giving up because God never delays unnecessarily. Look at verse 4. For some time this judge refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And then verse 8, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. The judge, putting off dealing with a persistent widow, waited a long, long, long time. So much so that it actually even wore him out. He finally relented and he helped her, not because he particularly cared about her, not because he was good, but, and not because he had compassion, but he did it because she was bugging him. The judge reluctantly answered her request. And it may seem that there are times when God is reluctant, where God uh, seems to be putting things in slow mode. And sometimes it feels like God's not listening. Sometimes, like the disciples, we may think that God is asleep in the bow of the boat and we're going down. But God promises that He will never delay. They will receive justice, and they'll receive it quickly. In fact, in Isaiah 65, 24, the Lord says, Before you even call, I will answer you. <laughs> I like that one. He even knows what I'm going to whine about. He even knows what I'm going to pray for. Before you even call, the answer's on its way. And while you are yet speaking... You didn't get it out of your mouth. I hear you. There's a German proverb that said, when in prayer you clasp your hands, God opens His. Prayer is important. Persistence is important because there are a lot of things 
in this world that God would love to do in your life, for you, in you, and through you. But most of those things fall in what is called the permissive will of God. And James said it this way, you have not because you ask not. That's it. Billy Graham said it this way, the heavens are full of the answers to prayer for which nobody ever bothered to ask. That's what it means in Isaiah. Before you called, I already had the solution. It was right here. I've got it. And while you're yet speaking, I will answer you. In other words, we get this image like the the parable of the prodigal son where God is running to meet us when we cry out to Him. And, And we don't have to pester God until persistence overcomes His reluctance. That's the way a lot of people think. In fact, in some churches, when they're waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they have services called tarrying service. And, and in those services, you just you get to church and you just stay there until you get what you want. i got to tell you, that is a very, very theologically unsound thing to do. The widow had to wear down the unjust judge. And likewise, sometimes we tend to approach God that same way. And But Jesus is not saying that we're to pester God until He gives in and does what we want. Getting our way in opposition to God would actually be a very dangerous thing. The Israelites are a great example. They're in the desert. God has just blessed them with manna that falls from the sky so they have food. And there is a rock, literally a rock that follows them through the wilderness that pours out the water. Because, you know, Moses struck the rock. And in Corinthians it says, and that rock followed them. Like, you know, pet rock. That's where the idea probably came from. But that rock followed them. And, and, and so they're not happy. They got food falling out of the sky. And they've got a rock following them to give them water. And they're not satisfied. They wanted meat. And they begin to pray and demand meat. When we were in Egypt, we had all the meat to eat that we wanted. We're sick of this manna. And I'm sure the the wives tried to to do it differently, you know, banana bread and that's, you know, let's mix it up. But it was still manna. It still, it was what it was. Manicotti, I could go on and on. But but you get the idea that they, they wanted meat and then finally they prayed and they interceded and they argued, you're not a good God. And so God caused these quail to fly into the camp and fall. And in Psalms it said, And while the meat was still in their teeth, He sent a wasting disease upon them, a curse. Sometimes God gives you what you want to your detriment. It happens, people. When we persist angrily to go against God. So in this parable, the idea is not that we just keep push, pushing and, and twisting and, and forcing God somehow to do what we want. We're determined to get our own way. That's not what this is talking about. It's a dangerous thing to try to handle God that way. C.S. Lewis said that in the end, when we stand before God, there will really only be two kinds of people. Those who say to God, Thy will be done. And those to whom God says, Thy will be done. That's the two kinds of people. I'm not sure we want to get our way. God loves to give His children what is good for them, and He does it without any unnecessarily delays, but it's still in His timing. In Luke 11, 13, If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? You don't have to pester God to get His attention. You don't have to grovel. You don't have to whine. You don't have to flail around. You don't have to try to guilt Him into giving you what you think you want. We've all done it. I know you have. We try to guilt God. Oh God, you just don't know how bad this is. And if you were a loving Father, you would really do this. I mean, we won't say it exactly like that. But but that's the essence of it, right? 
You don't have to bite your lip and groan and moan and all those kinds of things, sackcloth and ashes. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It's laying hold of His absolute willingness, but yielding ourselves because He is good and because He cares and because we know that He will not delay unnecessarily. Eugene Peterson, the author of the Message translation of the Bible, said in prayer, we are aware that God is in action and that when the circumstances are ready, when others are in the right place, and when our hearts are prepared, He will call us into action. Waiting in prayer is a disciplined refusal to act before God acts. It's a disciplined refusal to act before God acts. And I have to make this last point. If we give up, we lose out. One of the, the, the greatest men of faith in the Christian history was the English preacher George Mueller. He wrote these words about prayer. He wrote a book on prayer I would uh, highly recommend. But he said, the great point is to never give up until the answer comes. I've been praying for 63 years and 8 months for one man's conversion. He is not saved yet, but he will be. How can I how can it be otherwise? I am praying and God hears me. And the funny thing about that, he wrote these words and then George Mueller died and the man still was not a born again believer. But as they lowered Mueller's casket in the ground, that man was there and he stood in tears over the grave and gave his heart to the Lord. Because Mueller believed that God was good and that he really cared and he did not delay unnecessarily. We serve a good God who knows us and He loves us. He's committed Himself to us and has promised no unnecessary delays. And our job is simply to remain faithful. And as I wrestle with this parable, God impressed me with something. That we don't pray enough at the mission. We really, really, really do not pray enough. We, we talk about it, we have lessons on it, but we don't pray enough. We don't seek out God's face. And so I met this week with, with Tony, and we talked about ways of, of urging and encouraging prayer. And, and, and we've come up with a few ideas. We're, we're, we're going to be laying those out over the next few weeks. But i got to tell you, whatever we do, uh, we, we have to do it in the context of prayer. And prayer, yes, it's telling God what's on our heart, but it's also listening. In fact, it's, most of it is listening. It's, it's waiting patiently because, unlike an unjust judge, God is very good. He cares passionately for each one of us, and He will never delay unnecessarily. Let's stand. Holy Father, as we gather here, Lord, our, our hearts are open to you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to search us now and help us, Father, to, to see those places where we are far from you. And I just, if everyone would just bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. Uh, I sense that there are people here that need prayer. There are some here, I, I know it in my spirit, there are some here who don't know Jesus that way, who have never been born again. And, and if you don't mind, just lift your hand real quick. I'm going to pray for you. That's all I'm going to ask you to do is lift your hand. Thank you. Any others? Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, you know the hearts and lives behind each of those who lifted their hands. 
Father, they lifted their hands because they don't know you this way, but they want to. And you promised in your word that, Father, those who come to you, you will in no wise cast out. That's your promise. And if your word means anything, if words mean anything, then, Father, I ask you to, to lay hold of each of those individuals who lifted their hands. And I ask you to draw them to your heart. I ask you, Father, that you would forgive them for the sin in their life that has manifested itself in various ways, in behaviors and attitudes that, uh, that aren't good. But Father, what's really behind all of that is the sin of turning away from you. And so Father, this morning, we turn our face to you. We ask you, Father, to come into our life. Send your Holy Spirit to make our spirits that are dead in sin alive again. And cause our spirits to cry out to you, Abba, Father. I ask you, Father, to come now and seal those individuals with your spirit, with the spirit of truth. Father, allow them to lay hold of you. Fill them with a strong, strong sense of your presence now, Father God. I know there are also other needs. If you raise your hand and for prayer, I, I would encourage you to come and let our prayer team pray for you individually. But also, if there are other needs in your life, they, they, they could be anything. Our prayer team is here. They're ready to pray with you about any need. They've been trained to pray with you about whatever is on your heart. I want to encourage you to come as we sing. After this, we'll move into a time of Holy Communion.